So Malik set that up really well because what I'm going to do today is uh, I'm going to peel back some of those layers and do a strip tease for all of you, <laughs> which will be a failure. Um, I, I'm really happy to be here. Thank you so much to Creative Mornings for, for doing these events. And thank you to the Bank House for, for hosting it. Thank you to Kind for feeding us. Uh, we love those guys. We work with them in April. Um, and thank you to Infraculture for helping to, to get the word out. I don't know everyone here, which is great. So, um, so failure. Wow. Um, there it is. So, I picked this month because the topic was failure. I looked at, they gave me a list of all the topics that I could possibly do. And I saw failure there and it just kind of called out to me. And it called out to me because it's something that I've traditionally been terrified of, to tell you the truth. So what I'm going to do today is I'm going to talk about, I think, a different public perceptions of failure, especially as it relates to creativity. And then I'm going to talk about some of the things that, that I've done in Miami since 2005 that I think play some of those themes out, maybe. Um, so bring some personal experience into it. And uh, so, when I wanted to learn what people thought about failure, um, I first started reading Nietzsche, and then, that's a joke by the way. Um, <laughs> but then I realized there was this app uh, that you could get for your phone, which has all of this contemporary philosophy on it. It's like this library of contemporary philosophy, and it's called Instagram. <laughs> So, you know, some of the greatest technological minds of our generation created this application which is perfect for sharing photos. And all people do is write all over it, like it's a bathroom wall. And why is that? Why are we always writing on Instagram? Well, for one, uh, I think it's what I've learned through Miami is that people feel a deep need to contextualize their experience in the world. They really feel a need to put things into words. So, I think we can't help ourselves but write on Instagram. But when you look at the topic of success and failure specifically, and I think those two things are inextricably linked. You can't really talk about failure without success, and you can't talk about success without failure. I noticed that they all kind of fall into two different types. So one of those is what I call failure denial. And this, these, these are often sports related. Um, you know, so failure is not an option, winning is the only thing. You'll see a lot of Vince Lombardi and Michael Jordan quotes. Basically saying that, you know, we're never going to fail, we're never going to take a day off, we're going to be perfect, and we all know that's BS. Anyone who can actually be that perfect, I don't want to be friends with you because you're a robot. So failure is going to happen, um, and we can try and say that, that it's not going to happen, but, but it's a reality. So then another version is failure as process. And this I think you'll see more commonly inside of the creative world. So it's failure is a stepping stone. It's, it's part of the process. It's a speed bump. It's how we build up to success. Success, in other words, is made up of all of these different failures and then eventually we arrive. So, you know, you get Starbucks, you know, being turned down 242 times by banks. Uh, and then there's Starbucks. You get this little mouse um, doing his, uh, you know, his push-ups in the the trap there. Uh, if you can't read that, that says, "What doesn't kill you makes, makes you stronger," which actually is a quote from Nietzsche. I did read Nietzsche. It wasn't just a joke. Um, but the uh, in the same book, uh, Nietzsche also talks about the fact that we have a habit as people of turning things into cause and effect out of our lives, out of the feeling of failure. So things that we're afraid of, we try to contextualize them to make ourselves feel better about them. So if something bad happens, 
we, we try to explain it away by saying, oh, well, that, that was meant to happen, it's, that needed to happen to lead up to this. And sometimes that's true, but I think that's also just a way for us to cope with being in the world, cope with the fact that, yes, failure happens all the time, yes, there is suffering, there's no way to avoid it, and we have to have some sort of strategy to get through our lives, and so this is what we come up with. But I think as a creative person, for me anyway, this isn't really helpful in terms of actually making things, and especially making things really great, which I think should be all of our goals in creating things. Not just to create stuff, but to create things that are truly amazing and make us feel more human and make us more in touch with, with who we are as humans, which a huge part of being human is frailty. It's weakness. There's no way to avoid that. And that's part of what makes things beautiful. So I have an alternative construction of this. This handsome fellow right here, uh, his name's Morton Feldman. He was a composer. Howard's laughing. Uh, he died in 1987. Uh, he was mostly unknown in the United States, even to classical audiences. People didn't like his music. They said it was too quiet. Um, but he's also one of the smartest people about the creative process, I think, in the 20th century. So this, this quote is from an interview that he gave uh, and the interviewer was talking to him about composition as a profession. And so they started to compare it to you know, another profession. When people talk about professions, I feel like they always talk about doctors and lawyers. That's what always happens. So they were talking about him. This is what Bowman said. He said, but there is that doctor who opens you up, does exactly the right thing, closes you up, and you die. He failed to take the chance that might have saved you. Art is a crucial, dangerous operation we perform on ourselves. Unless we take a chance, we die in art. And I don't think that chance is failure. And that's kind of my thesis for today. I think the chance is actually trying to make something beautiful. And I think the risk in trying to make something beautiful is exposing that frailty and that weakness and, and those things that we associate a lot of times with failure. So if you're just explaining failure away as a speed bump, you're sublimating it under this larger goal of success, I think you're missing the point if you're truly trying to make something beautiful. So this is my book of poems. Those of you with really good eyesight can read it right now. <laughs> Uh, and the book of poems is actually about Martin Feldman synergy. Um, and this picture is from 2006, actually, when I first completed the book. This book is still not published, uh, which is not a cry for help or a plea for you to publish it, assuming there are any publishers out there. Um, but I want to talk about, I think, why it's not published and why the book that's up here in this picture looks nothing like the collection of poems that I have right now. And I think the reason is that I was trying to succeed by writing the poems. Like, I really wanted them to be a success. I, I loved Porn Fowen so much, and I still do. And I thought he was such a great topic for a book of poems. You know, here's this, like, dead genre, and I'm talking about this composer that no one has heard of, and you're going to be like, who is that? And you're talking about it in the poem. It just seems so perfect to me. And I wanted it to succeed and just be this perfect book of poems. And that's why they weren't working. I think I wasn't, you know, performing that operation on myself. I wasn't taking that risk of really making them beautiful and having some sort of weakness or frailty inside them. So the book uh, is still in my computer. But at the same time I was doing that, I started this fake organization, um, which those of you who have gone to fake universities may have heard of. It's the premier fake university in Miami and maybe the world. It's called University of Wynwood. I founded it in, in 2008 in the Wynwood Law School building where I was writing that book. And uh, I did it because I was leaving grad school and I was here in Miami and I knew I wasn't leaving Miami and I wanted to form some sort of community that was literary that I could be a part of. And so we started doing all sorts of grassroots things. Um, I hosted a lecture series. You can see some of the people up there, like Lauren Reskin and Renee Morales uh, from Ham, came and spoke. And we did things like poetry readings. We also got together and we made scenes and, and sold them on the street and things like that. Um, so this is one of the things that we used to do. It's called Home Depot, 
where we can set up manual typewriters during Art Walk. This is Art Walk in 09, so you can see it's, it's a little less crowded than Art Walk today. Uh, but we were still really busy. We'd go out there with our typewriters and we'd ask anyone who was going by, hey, give us a topic, and, you know, let's give me a topic, Alex. Anything. Culture. So you would get the topic and you'd say, okay, I'm going to write you a poem about culture. They'd give us a couple bucks and then I'd give the poem back to you. Um, and we did this you know, on a regular basis. We also made a journal that we, we gave out to people. And all of it was like, success and failure kind of didn't come into it. The point was just to do it. When we would make the journal, uh, we would all go to my house. And the goal was to make the journal in one night. So you would come with your poems and then we put it together. And a lot of times it took to like 5 in the morning. But the point wasn't the finished product. The point was just to have an occasion for all of us writers to be together and hang out and share each other's work. Uh, and then, simultaneously, I was writing these Feldman poems and sending them out to literary journals. So those of you who have never submitted to a literary journal, there are hundreds of them all over the country and no one reads them. <laughs> the only people that read them are the people who are in them, and in that case they only read their poem, and the people whose mothers are the people who are in it, that's, they also probably read it, but they also only read that one poem. So, and I was like desperate to be in all these literary magazines. Uh, you know, so I would send out you know, submissions every month. I was so diligent about it. I worked so hard at it. And I put them in these envelopes. This is before, it took the literary world a long time to realize you could submit online. So, I mean, this is like 2010, 2011. I'm still like packing envelopes and buying stamps and sending these things off. And uh, I remember this one specifically. I took a picture of it because it was the most envelopes I'd ever sent out at one time. And so I remember specifically that feeling of like, look at all these envelopes. One of these poems is going to get taken. None of them got taken. They were all, they were all rejected. Um, but this was my art. I was like, you know, this is part of it. You write these poems, you send them out. And then I go out at night and I do Poem Depot. Um, and, and this is actually a picture from the Bakehouse when we did it here in 2009. But the, uh, I do Poem Depot and I write a poem, and it wasn't that good. It's probably really terrible most of the time because I wrote it in like 15 seconds and I might have been drinking. And, uh, but I'd give it to someone and I'd see their reaction and, and they'd laugh or you know, they'd say like, wow, how did you know that about me? I was like, I don't know, it was Miller Lite talking, I have no idea. You know, whereas at home I was writing these poems and, and just sending them out into the rest of the country and, and not really hearing anything back. So the combination of these experiences, I think, started to lead up to Old Miami. Um, and this is the last point I want to make before I get to Old Miami. So this is a, a panel discussion we did at, at Gallery Diet in, I think this was 2009. It was a panel discussion on the importance of the director, Michael Bay. <laughs> and the, the kid all the way on the end, that, that's a 12-year-old who was on the panel. Because when you do a panel on Michael Bay, the 12-year-old you know, perspective is actually really vital to understanding what's going on. Um, but this is the kind of things we were doing here in Miami, and it was so much fun. Uh, I just felt like, at that time, you know, we could program anything, and Miami was like, yes, I'd love to go to that panel on Michael Bay, sure. You know, like, this is at uh, Nina uh, Johnson and Lucy's gallery, Gallery Diet, and I was like, hey, I want to do a panel on Michael Bay in your gallery. And she was like, sure, why not? You know? And, uh, and it was so amazing, and I was like, man, this Miami that I live in, like I write poems, and I give them to people on the street, and they love them, and I, you know, we do all these cultural things, and my friends are doing all these intellectual things, like Miami's so awesome. And yet, for everybody else, this is what Miami looks like. <laughs> you know, it's this place that's like, you know, it has no culture, it's like a failed city-state overrun by corruption and bureaucracy. I'm not saying any of those things aren't true, but, you know, everybody else looked at it and were like, this is a terrible, why would you want to be a poet in Miami? I mean, being a poet is already sort of like admitting failure, but then to do it <laughs> in Miami, it's like you're a failure in failure town, you're just compounding your problems. But my, my Miami wasn't like that at all. You know, I, I mean, I think this lady's from Boca, by the way. I don't think she's really from Miami. And I'm from Boca, so I can say that. I can say that. Uh, you know, my experience here was completely opposite of that. And so I realized that, 
you know, the rest of the country didn't care, but Miami did. So I eventually got the message. Um, and we started Oh Miami with support from the Knight Foundation. And what we really tried to do with it, I think, was uh, Knight and I had been working together for a little while on, on a much smaller scale. And we really wanted to raise the stakes. And I think in the same way, you know, to go back to the Feldman quote, we really wanted to do something bigger and more beautiful, and that couldn't be contained under the guise of success or failure, which I think ultimately is kind of low stakes if we're trying to make something beautiful. And uh, so we came up with this mission to try and reach every single person in Miami-Dade County with a poem. Uh, we're going to assume beforehand that Miami's going to love it, that this place is literary, that it does have culture, that it's going to work, and we're just going to do it. You know, We're not going to ask permission. <laughs> we're just going to get it out there. So. Um, we came up with this name too, I think the name is important, which is why I included the slide. The, the name is composed of the letter O and then Miami. So the O comes from the classic ode, you know, like where you loved something, if it was your beloved, you would address it with the O comma. It's not O apostrophe, O comma. Um, and, and then the object of our desire, our beloved, is Miami, which is really the point to me. It's, yes, it's a poetry festival, but poetry is only the medium. The actual subject of the festival is Miami. That's the point of it, really. And poetry is just, you know, we have to whittle it down somehow. So poetry is the way in which we express our love. So speaking of not asking permission, this is the artist Randy Berman. And one of the things we do at Miami is we ask uh, artists and writers in the community to propose projects to us uh, that help us with this mission of trying to reach everyone with a poem. So Randy came up with this idea of, let's put poems on street signs. You know, there's so much discursive, boring prose in the world out in Miami itself. Let's put some poetry uh, on some of these signs. And so we, we sort of crowdsourced a bunch of poems from, from a bunch of talented people we knew. And then Randy picked his eight favorite, and we made 155 metal street signs that are like, you know, um, professional grade, so to speak. And we put them up all over the place. And every now and then, I'll be on Instagram looking for philosophy, and I'll come across someone I don't even know posting one of these signs, uh, being like, I don't know who's doing this, but I love it. And, and that's, to me, the best part of the festival. It's great to me that there's not a logo on the sign. In fact, it's important. In the same way that I wouldn't put a logo on a poem I write, I would never put a logo on one of these signs, because that's not the point. The point is, is the beauty of it. This is something else we did this April. Um, those of you who are Cuban were probably forced to memorize the poetry of Jose Marti when you were young. So what we did is uh, we said all these other people are reciting Jose Marti. Let's put, let Jose Marti recite poems for himself. So uh, we had worked with the actor Ivan Lopez before. He's super talented. He loves Marti. He knows like 12 Marti poems by heart already. So we got him a white horse, or rather, Melody got him a white horse. I would never be capable of finding a white horse, but she found a white horse. And we let him ride up and down Calle Ocho, uh, reading Jose Marti poems from memory to anyone who was around. So this is him going into the Domino Park and reciting poems. And then we had about 250 white roses with little Marti poems on them, and, and uh, we had everybody on the staff handing the, the poems out as we went. And then, you know, even Jose Martí gets hungry, so he went through drive through And when you run a nonprofit, you end up doing a whole lot of things you never anticipated doing with your life. So someone has to pick up the horse poop, it might as well be the director. Uh, this is another uh, way that I think we, we, like to, uh, we like to put poetry out in the world. Is, you know, there's all this advertising space in Miami. And since Knight sort of blessed us with, with the budget to be able to do some of this stuff, we were like, why, why should we send poems to literary magazines that no one's going to read? Miami is our literary magazine. Let's publish poems there. Uh, so this is on 79th Street. Uh, you can still go to this billboard right now. It's still up. The billboard is owned by the sketchiest man I've ever met in my life. Uh, his name is Carlos, and he sells used Bentleys down in Sweetwater. <laughs> I don't recommend going to see him unless you know you like the movie Scarface because he's like right out of it. Um, but so we put a poem by a guy named Todd Boss up there. And you never know what's gonna happen with something like this. For instance, this guy, did he read the poem? Did he like it? Did he go home and start writing his own poetry? You just have no idea with something like this. 
So another thing we do is put palms behind airplanes, uh, which we flew up and down Miami Beach. We've done this uh, twice now. And the first time we did it, we picked the palms ourselves. The second time we did it, uh, we did a call out to the community and we asked people in Miami to submit palms to us. So that's one of these. Um, and then this is the other one, which I love because it's, it's sort of like a sound poem. Um, and I'm not going to say it because I'll probably butcher it. Uh, Miamians like to drink. There's a lot of bars and clubs here, so why not put a poem on a drink poster, put it beneath someone's drink. A poet named Paul Christensen came up with this idea for us. In 2011, we asked the artist Augustina Woodgate to make poetry clothing tags. So at events, she would sew the tags into your clothing for you, but she also, throughout the month of April, went to thrift stores in Miami and would clandestinely sew these poems into, into the clothing in the thrift stores. And, you know, so someone would go home and, you know, all of a sudden there's, there's a poem in my pants. How did they get there? <laughs> and then, people love that project so much, uh, we asked Augustina to do another one. So the one she did this year was called Scratch Poems. So she made lottery tickets uh, out of a poem that we sourced from a poet named Mary Rufel, who's amazing. Uh, if you feel like Googling something after this, Google Mary Rufel Harvard lecture. She did this 20 minute lecture at Harvard last year that's like mind blowing. Uh, so we distributed these tickets you know, in different places, at different events. Uh, we had a bodega on 8th Street selling them at the counter. Uh, this is one of my favorite beautiful failures. We, in 2011, we, we loaded up a bunch of, um, of poems onto a helicopter. And it was all vegetable-based ink and 100% recyclable paper. And we dropped them out of the helicopter over uh, Sweatstock and Sweat Records, if you know that concert. And so they, uh, the, the guys in the helicopter were, were really anal about, about where you can drop it. Apparently, this is a thing, by the way. Like, things get dropped in my head all the time. This is like part of their business model, is dropping stuff from helicopters. When I called them up, I was like, would you guys ever drop poems out of a helicopter? I know this is crazy. And I was like, yeah, we just dropped like 200 basketballs the other day. <laughs> like, where do we live that this, this is an industry? <laughs> So we dropped the poems, and, and right as he dropped them, like the wind picked up, and they went all over Little Haiti, like just everywhere, which was awesome. It was great. It, you know, like we could have never planned that. And this is a project we did. I'm going to do a couple of slides on this one. So the, this is the partnership we did with the Relay Group this year, where they have this halfway house, which is part of a new development that they're doing in Edgewater, and they gave us the house for the month of April. So we took this former halfway house, which we saw as a place where people went to re recuperate, you know, they went to like heal themselves in some way. And we called it the Edgewater Poetry and Athletics Club. So we turned it into a place where literature could happen, um, that the other healthy activities could happen, and it would really be a community space for the month of April. Um, it was a pretty run down when we got it. This is the, there's a basketball court next to the house. Uh, the pool looked not so swimmable. And the related group helped us fix it up, and we invited two artists from Guatemala uh, to come up and do an installation in the house. So they repainted it, and they did a lot of things with it, um, including that they made a guide to the neighborhood that originated at the house. So if you go to Edgewater now, uh, you can still find these lines out there. So they started at the house, and then they went to different places in the neighborhood that the, that the artists went to. So one of them went to a guardrail on Biscayne Bay, and when you got to the guardrail, on the guardrail, there's a poem by the Chilean poet Nicanor Parra uh, on the guardrail. Another one, this pink one, led to the nearest coffee counter. So that's important. Yeah. And then the last one led to this, this kind of accidental green space that the artist created. It was kind of an empty lot next to a condo building, but they strung a hammock in between two trees and made it like a place of repose for the month of April. Uh, and then they also hung hammocks in the house so that people, when they came to the house, would have a place to read and sit and relax and talk to each other. And then we began to program the house. Uh, this is a water aerobics class we had in the pool. The leader of the, of the water aerobics class is Qusi Amador from Afrobeta, who is the most amazing water aerobics instructor I've ever met. Uh, we had a lifeguard. This is uh, Jim Drain, our lifeguard, and we gave him this, this poetry swimsuit to wear. We did yoga. We had three free yoga classes on the basketball court during April. And we also played basketball. 
uh, on the court. So we had a basketball tournament that we collaborated with a bunch of cultural organizations to, to produce basketball games. <laughs> This is a zine fair that we hosted at the house where we asked anyone who did like you know local sort of uh, DIY publishing could come and sell what they made or trade it with other people. And this was a huge hit, people really loved it. Uh, we did that in association uh, with Gusto and Books Are Nice. And then we also held workshops. This is the Cuban American poet Jose Coser, who led a Spanish language only poetry workshop at the house. And we also did poetry readings. Um, and this is a poet named Stephanie Strickland who had an interactive digital reading, and so we just projected the digital aspect of her reading onto the side of the house. And then we had other sort of more traditional readings outdoors. These photographs, by the way, all the beautiful ones are by Jesse Schilling. So, what's next? So, the, the project that we started this year is a small press called Highlight Books. And the reason we started it is that we felt like this was something that was really missing in Miami's literary culture. And I say culture because I think that's an important word, not just because it's part of a different culture thing. The last thing that we want to create is a literary scene. A scene to me implies a group of people that may or may not be related to the rest of the population. It's sort of something hermetic and set off to the side that may or may not have any effect on the rest of, of uh, the area. Whereas a culture implies something that's pervasive. It's something that you can't get away from whether you want to or not. It's like a humidity. I mean, if you're like me, you stay inside most of the time to avoid it. But at some point, if you go out, you're going to interact with it. And that's what we want literature to be in Miami. We want it to be something that's just there. It's a fact of life. And without publishing, I don't think that can really happen. So this is our first book. It's called Forager. One of the authors, Tiffany's here. It's an amazing book about picking your own fruit. Uh, and other plants here in Miami. And the press itself is based on Highlight, which I think is one of these amazingly, I don't know, like hidden gems about Miami. The fact that like, Highlight is still played here is, is amazing. This is sort of a, an average uh, day at Highlight. <laughs> uh, the crowds are not as capacity as they used to be. If uh, you were in Miami in the 80s, you probably remember a lot of headlines about match fixing and mob-related activity and highlights, something that was a huge problem, and it really took a downturn. Um, this is now the face of Highlight, Big Randy. Uh, I mean, he seems like he's fun to hang out with, but it's not that inspiring. Whereas, Highlight has all these amazing traditions about it. For instance, all the cestas are handmade. It's part of the rules. So, you know, every fronton would have a guy like this who, like, his job was to make the cestas. Um, and all the, all the pelotas, the balls, are also handmade, and they only last one game. So, a pelota lasts one game, and then they gotta get a new one. Uh, but this is Highlight, you know, in, like, the 50s in Miami. It was, like, the thing to do. You put on your tuxedo, you went out to Highlight on Friday night, and it was this amazing, uh, elegant, incredible experience. And this was the Fronton, which is now Casino Miami Highlight. This building is gorgeous. And every time I see this photo, I'm reminded that Miami has such an incredible history. Like, there's so many amazing things that have happened, even in the short sort of 100 plus year history of Miami, that no one talks about and no one focuses on when they, when they start saying Miami has no culture or history. You know, and one of the reasons it's our own fault is that we take a building like this and we turn it into that. <laughs> and somewhere underneath that is that brick building. Like, and to me, that's the metaphor for like all of Miami. Like, it's under the surface, all of the good stuff is there. We just have to like crack open this like plaster and concrete um, that someone slapped over it. Um, and just how it itself is beautiful. And every every aspect of it to me says beauty and elegance. And so we thought it was a fitting, very Miami thing for the press. Because the goal of the press is to create a literary voice for Miami in some way. So this is our seal, which is based, or no, this is our logo, uh, which is based obviously on this idea of the SESTA. Uh, we want to make books that are very unique, that are handmade. The creative director of the press, Steph, is here. Uh, and he's kind of the linchpin behind that to making books that every single one of them should feel special and unique. And you should really be excited about holding it in your hand. And then this is the, the seal, the more fleshed out name and everything like that. And so this fall, we're, uh, we're going to release two more books at the Miami Book Fair. So when you come to the Miami Book Fair, come find us. 
And then finally, uh, for All Miami 2015, we're going to be partnering again with the New World Symphony and doing a thing which we call Poetry in the Park. And I think it's, the reason I picked it last is because it's something I think could have never happened in 2011. Like we never would have been able to pull this off. And to me it shows, I think, even how much the needle has gone uh, just in the sort of three or four years that we've been doing this. Um, we use their amazing wall cast system to put poetry up there. So those of you who've been to the movies, you've seen the, the symphony perform there. We, we put poets up there. Uh, and we had almost 500 people show up, which was, for poetry reading, that's like probably 10 years of poetry reading audiences. <laughs> Um, and they just sat there and they listened as these, these two poets spoke and because the sound is so good there, you can sit there outside and it's like someone's whispering in your ear. So it has this amazing confluence of intimacy but also uh, that feeling of being together in a public place which I think is so integral to the future of Miami. So we're going to do it again this spring is the point, so stay tuned for that. Um, so then, <laughs> this is Melody's slide. Uh, so, I think what I want to sum up with is, you know, as you're, you're out there on Instagram or you're, you're trying to motivate yourself to create, um, don't think about the success or failure of it, but think about, you know, what sort of beauty or humor or magic can, can I put into what I'm doing today? And then when you start out on your journey, you will not fail. Thank you. <laughs>